Welcome. This is Catholic Discovery 101, a program dedicated to sharing the Catholic faith that we love with all our friends and neighbors in the entire Diocese of Boise, and especially right here in the Pocatello and Chubbuck area. I'm Diane Nisita. I'm a parishioner at Holy Spirit Catholic Community, and our guest today is Thomas Smith. And I have to tell you right away, Thomas Smith is here for the third time in just a little over two years. Uh, you remember, uh, may remember that Thomas is a parish mission and conference uh, speaker and that he is uh, a greatly loved and appreciated uh, presenter for the Great Adventure Bible Study Program. Our focus today is going to be Thomas connecting December's Advent and Christmas liturgical season with Pope Francis's joy of the gospel. In this, Pope Francis declares himself a devotee, He's, his devotion to Mother Mary, and he also calls her a model evangelizer. Thomas, what is this? model evangelizer business. It's great. Yeah, like, as you point out, uh, Pope Francis has a great personal devotion to Our Lady, and you see her all the way through the document. I think she's mentioned about 40 times in the document. Uh, it's not only an intercessor for the body of Christ and our work to evangelize, but she herself is a model evangelizer. So I thought it would be wonderful during the season of Advent, where Mary is such a pivotal role and the season of Christmas, uh, as we um, prepare for the coming of Christ and we do penance in, in order to prepare ourselves for Christ and we look forward with joyful anticipation to Christ's coming, that looking at a, a particular Marian style of sharing Christ would be an appropriate topic for us to explore. I, I think this, this is a grand idea. It came to me, it stunned me at first. Mary, the model evangelizer? How does that work? Exactly. So I, I've identified uh, seven key ways that Mary is a model evangelizer, and there's many, many more. But I, I I'm, would like to just hit the highlights, I think, that Pope Francis opens up for us and how she does it. And the first way she does it is simply her openness to encounter. If we think about that young 14, 15-year-old girl who has the angel Gabriel appear to her and say, uh, you're going to give birth to a son, you're going to conceive a son, he's going to sit on David's throne. Uh, how overwhelming that must have been and how she probably was, uh, you know, most of us would say, I think Rachel next door would be a better choice, God. I, I, I'm maybe not the greatest pick. But her interior openness to an encounter with God in receiving the life of Christ within her and her ongoing pilgrimage of faith where she's open to how God is working himself out in her life, uh, such a beautiful way to begin. And that, that's the model of an evangelizer because everything begins with that idea of encounter. And Pope Francis recognizes this. He's going to use that term right out of the gate at the beginning of the document. And he, he has a great line I thought was um, so passionate. He says that I invite all Christians everywhere at this very moment to a renewed personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Or at the very least, he says, to an openness to the possibility of an encounter with Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say that I ask you to do all of you to do this unfailingly every day. So he recognizes that the encounter we need to have with the Lord isn't a single event any more than Mary's encounter was a single event, but it, it has to be an ongoing renewal. And he recognizes that it, that's a huge challenge in the church. Uh, statistics yeah. say that 48% of our Catholics in the pews on Sunday don't even believe an encounter with God is possible. That's pretty sobering. So we've fundamentally failed as Catholic parishes to create an environment, what I like to call a, a culture of encounter, where we create spaces and places and our ministries help to do this, where people can encounter God directly, either through word or sacrament or through the community or through our works of service in the community. And then that encounter is cultivated within the larger Christian community. So if you think about half of our parishes, uh, those people you have coffee and donuts with after yeah. Mass, don't think that's possible. So that means they're going to church uh, out of guilt or pressure or just family tradition. obligations or fear, tradition. Uh, you know, at best, God is an impersonal force or maybe He's a distant deity, but, but that they don't acknowledge that He would want to be part of their life. Pope Francis wants to address that, and, and Mary models that, just that openness to 
the, the, the possibility that God wants to encounter us, as the Catechism says, He thirsts for us. So that's the first way I think she models And that's astonishing and a, a huge job for some of us who weren't taught that that was a possibility. It, we were taught if you, if you did all the things that you were supposed to do right and you confessed it once a year, that you were a good Catholic. Yeah, it's more about what we did rather than focusing on what yes. Christ did and that he wants to engage actually in our spiritual life at a, at a very deep level. So I think Mary um, models that, you know, and, and then she models it with just her, her constant openness to that. You know, when, when it was proposed that she could receive the Christ, all of heavens was weighted with bated breath, you know, what she would say, and she gave her fiat, her yes. And so Pope Francis says, just give God your yes. Just be open to the possibility of encounter and recognize that that's something that's ongoing that we need so to cultivate. So that is another way to approach the Advent Christmas season. Absolutely. To be aware that a yes is being waited for. Yes, and our faith actually teaches us there's three births we anticipate during this season. We anticipate the birth we celebrate in the nativity when, when Christ comes to be a human person for us and, and is born into our world. But we also celebrate his birth on our altars all over the world today, that in the sacramental life of the church he's made present to us and in the community of faith gathered around that table. And then thirdly, he's birthed anew in our hearts during this season of Advent. So in all three of those ways, we welcome him anew and we say yes in a renewed way to, to him coming into our life in a, in a, a long, life-giving, loving way for us. Okay, I think it's time to move on to the night. No, no, yeah. <laughs> filled with joy. Yeah, so number two, uh, he would, of course, joy is the name of the document, the joy of the gospel. It's used over a hundred times in the document. And I, my definition of joy is this joy is the inner delight of knowing that you are infinitely loved by God. That's what joy is the inner delight of knowing I'm infinitely loved by God. And Mary understood that. It's the first fruits of receiving his love in our life as it produces a joy in us. So Pope Francis would say uh, we should join this great story of joy. He, he's going to do a, a sweeping survey of salvation history. He calls it a, the stream of joy. And he'll go through the Old Testament and then he, he ends with Mary and talks about how joy is just constantly present in this story. And then he invites us to, to enter that stream. Why, why should we resist entering that stream of joy? He, in Mary's life, the angel greeting is rejoice, Mary, or hail, Mary. Uh, that joy is contagious because she carries it to Elizabeth's home and John the Baptist leaps for joy. Uh, so she shares that joy. And then, of course, her Magnificat, uh, my soul rejoices in God my Savior because he's done great things for me, this little handmaid of his. So we see joy permeating that uh, encounter of the Annunciation, which is what we're celebrating in part. And then we see that joy uh, carried out into the visitation, the mystery of the visitation into Elizabeth's home. And so he calls us to manifest that joy. It's already our pure gift from God through our baptism. And joy is contagious. Uh, mm -hmm. When we meet a joyful Christian, we want what they have. And so he says that we really operate as Catholics, uh, as evangelizers, uh, with attraction, the principle of attraction, that we're not imposing, we're not proselytizing but we carry a joyfulness into our world and that is attractive. Uh, I love how uh, Blessed Mother Teresa of Calcutta put it. She said, joy is the net of love through which we catch souls. It's a net through which we what catch souls. What you are suggesting, uh, that's what you told me before we started anyway, is that you want everybody to read this oh my while gosh. you are explaining it, but the point is to get a copy. Yes, it's really the mission and statement and mandate for the church, I think for the next decade or more. So I, I even bound my copy because it's, it's a workbook. It's really the Holy Spirit sharing with Pope Francis where the church needs to go. And it gives us all the practical ways we can begin to live out the missional nature of the church or what Pope Francis says to once again become not merely disciples of Jesus, but missionary disciples of Jesus. Hmm. Okay, let's move on. Point three. Yeah, so point number three is uh, that Mary cultivated a life of prayer and then she prayed with others. So we hear in Luke's gospel especially, when something happened in her life, she pondered it in her heart. She drew that uh, event into her heart and she reflected upon it. So she recognized that if we're gonna be a great evangelizer, we have to cultivate this relationship, this encounter. We have to nourish it uh, through a life of prayer for us to effectively carry it out into the world. 
And then she did something beautiful. She shared her prayer life with others. So she took her personal prayer, the Magnificat, celebrating what God had done, and that was made public. Uh, and it's given to us in the Gospels even. Uh, I've heard it said before, I, th I love this line, if you really want to know someone, eavesdrop on their prayer life. Mm -hmm. Because that's really where you get to know someone. And I don't know that many Catholics think about the idea of praying with someone. If someone expresses a need to us and we just you know, hold their hands or take them into a quiet corner and, and pray with them, when someone else hears our lived experience of God in the, in the language of conversation that we use in prayer, that evangelizes someone. Because that says God is approachable, God is near, uh, God is our friend, God is our Father, He wants to be in relationship with us, and we can talk to Him in the same conversational way we can talk to someone else that we love. So Mary evangelized through her prayer, and we can evangelize through our prayer. Uh, when I was a, a Mormon missionary, I had an older African-American woman pray when we were in her home one day. And I remember as, as I was listening to her pray, I thought, if I look up, I'm going to see Jesus on the couch next to her. Uh, I knew, though I was very religious, I didn't know God like that. She had this loving, living, life-giving relationship with God that was probably born out of a lifetime of suffering and pain and prejudice. She didn't have much materially, but she had Jesus. And that just radiated from her, me hearing her conversation, her prayer. And, and it made me s look at take a hard look at my own life and say, here I am very religious, I'm a missionary for heaven's sakes, but I don't know God like that. And I want to know God like that. So we evangelize through, through our prayers. And it's beautiful, the last time we see her interacting in the New Testament uh, is in Acts chapter 1. And what is she doing? She's praying with the disciples for the coming of, of the Holy Spirit upon them. And I think about her locked up in that room for nine days. It's the first novena from Ascension Thursday to Pentecost Sunday. Nine days praying for the Holy Spirit to come upon the church as it came upon her in the Annunciation, that they must have peppered her with questions because here's the person locked in the house with us who's been with Jesus from the Annunciation all the way to the Ascension. And so she would have uh, shared her, her reflections with them and shared her prayer life with them. So it's a very natural way for us as Catholics to evangelize is letting someone else in on our lived conversation with God. And I just know how profoundly I was affected by that. And, and so I really encourage Catholics to do that because it's non-combative, it's not confrontive. Uh, you're not pressuring someone in any kind of way. You're just allowing them a little window into your, your relationship with the Lord. I hear you. And I find it very hard to understand because in my day growing up, if you were in a restaurant, you didn't openly pray because that was a private thing. And that's what I was taught. And, and what we've got is we've gone very far ahead of my experience, of my lived experience as a youth. Right, and, and prayer certainly is personal, but never mm -hmm. private. Our faith is personal, private. but never private. So it's by its very nature intended to be shared. Uh, uh, Pope Francis said in his wonderful document, Lumen Fide, that it's like the light that's passed candle to candle in the Easter vigil. Yeah. How bizarre it would be if someone's candle was lit and then they just kept it to themselves <laughs> and didn't pass it down the pew. Okay. Uh, faith and our, f our particular faith is intended by its very nature to be given away in love. So it's, it's never private, but always personal. Yeah. Okay. Number four. <laughs> Number four. She shared her saving story with others. So we've already talked about the Magnificat. That's Mary saying, this is what the Lord has done for me. And we, we reflected that possibly she did that in the upper room at Pentecost. Uh, she, she recognized that God was at, at work in her life, and she shared the good news of what he had done for her. It's so analogous to the woman at the well. You know, she has this life-giving encounter with God. She meets Jesus. Her life is fundamentally changed by that encounter, and what's the first thing she does? With, with great joy, she carries it back to her villages. I wish we had the rest of the story with the Samaritan woman. You know, all those interactions she would have had with her people that really set the groundwork for the gospel to be preached affirmatively to the Samaritan people. Whatever happened, she was successful. They believed her 100%. Yes, yes. So, you know, we're plagued in the West with what Sherry Waddell, the, the great author of Forming Intentional Disciples, calls this don't ask, don't tell policy when it comes to our Catholic faith. 62% of Catholics seldom or ever talk about their faith with someone else or ask people about their, their faith. So Mary challenges me and Sherry Waddell has challenged me to say, how can we create in our parishes a do-ask, do-tell culture? How can we in small groups or our Bible studies or ministries in the parish create 
opportunities for people to feel comfortable talking about their Catholic faith with their fellow Catholics and give them the courage really to, to carry that uh, now out into the world and start talking to others. So Sherry, you know, asked, started asking a question with Called and Gifted about people's spiritual journey. And so I've made a commitment now uh, that I'm on planes, you know, 180 days out of the year, it seems like. Uh, so I generally will say to people when they ask me what I do after the beginning niceties that I'm a storyteller. I love to tell stories and I love to hear stories. And would you mind sharing your story with me? What's, what's your story? And if there's a spiritual part of your journey, I, I just love to hear those kind of stories. And it's so amazing that uh, the hundreds of times I've asked that, no one has ever said no. People are taken aback. They're surprised that someone wants to hear their story. But in the very telling of it, people start to see a pattern of God at work in their life that maybe they'd never even okay. noticed before. What was the question again? Would you mind? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I could say it in different configurations, but I, I just say I love to hear people's stories, and I'd love to hear your story, especially if there's a, a spiritual journey that you've been on in your life. Can you, can you share that with me? Pope Francis in the document says, we can't even begin to think about sharing the Word of God with another person until they have been heard by us. So we need to not only be storytellers, but story listeners. And when someone feels heard, that opens their heart to hearing the gospel and to our story. So what always happens invariably is after I've listened attentively and authentically to someone else's story, they'll then turn to me and say, hey, tell me your story. Then it's a reciprocal, it's, it's a dialogue, uh, there's no confrontation, there's no threat, there's no imposition, we're proposing. And so it, it creates a beautiful dialogue, and especially, you know, I was on a plane stuck with a guy named Keith from the, the Michigan area. We ended up staying all night in a Detroit airport, and we had some of the most fantastic spiritual discussions just from opening up with that, you know. And not everyone's willing to talk on an airplane. I even get in that habit of kind of just wanting to put on the headphones. But if I see there's a, a general receptivity to a conversation, uh, I've just had amazing experiences in doing that. So, so Mary models that for us, and, and Pope Francis encourages us to do that as well, is to, to create a do-ask, do-tell culture. And he even uses the language of testimony, that you have a story. And the human person is made for story. So it helps make the gospel incarnate when it's put in a story, that they see it fleshed out in someone's life. So I like to say that evangelization, Pope Francis style, is a manualization. That is, it's God is with us. That's what this, yeah, wonderful. That's what the season is all about, isn't it? Advent. Yes. God is with us, and He's with us in in our individual stories. And when we share that with another, that opens up the possibility that maybe God has been part of my story in ways I never saw before, and maybe He really wants to be more part of my story than I ever imagined. Mm. And that's a manualization. You know, that's the, that's what I think Pope Francis does so well is he's teaching us to flesh out the gospel in a lived experience so someone sees it in our life. Yeah. And uh, Pope uh, Paul VI, who was just uh, beatified um, this fall, he said that modern man wants witnesses, not teachers. Witnesses, not teachers. So before we can ever propose really the content of the gospel, they want to see it lived out in a life. And that's, that's making the gospel incarnate. It's making the word incarnate. And that's where people really get impacted when the gospel's put in a story, and a, a personal story, our own. So that's principle number four, is, is sharing that saving story with others and the, the impact that can have on people. Okay, <laughs> and we, we are supposed to begin during the holy seasons of Advent and Christmas with this. I mean, number five, number five. Yeah, number five is Mary evangelized through her care and concern for others. So one of the wonderful things Pope Francis has brought to the church's attention and, and energies again, I think, is this uh, going out to others that the gospel calls us not to be insular or navel gazing. And, and he warns us against this attitude of kind of being um, in, Focus on ourselves. Jesus called us to be the salt of the earth, and if we're to do that, we have to get out of the salt shaker. <laughs> uh, we build beautiful salt shakers, and that's wonderful. We have great communities of faith, but uh, we're called to go out. And so Mary did this, and she evangelized through her care and concern for others. So we see after her lived encounter at the Annunciation, what does she do? The, the Gospel of Luke says, with haste, she goes to her cousin Elizabeth's home, who's an elderly woman. Uh, uh, pregnant and needs some help. So her first uh, impetus is to go towards the other, 
to go to help another. And that's at the heart of evangelization too, that all of the works of mercy are part of sharing the good news of the gospel. When we love others authentically, when we reach out in communities, uh, we're, we're evangelizing in real and profound ways. Think about John's gospel, the very first time we see Mary. She's at the wedding feast of Canaan. What is she doing? She's attentive to the needs of those around her. Here's this little couple that's having a catering crisis, and she knows her son can do something about that. Uh, and it becomes much more mystical and powerful than, than just a catering crisis, but it, it's emblematic of her particular love. Pope Francis speaks of her consoling presence at the foot of the cross, that, that her love for Christ there and being present in that moment. I, I know when I was uh, first looking at the Catholic Church, uh, one of the great things that attracted me to the Catholic faith was I looked at, in my city, in the city of Denver, and said, what, what Christians are on the forefront of caring for the poorest of the poor, of those that the world is first ready to discard? And it was the Catholic Church. You know, it was the, the friars down at the Samaritan shelter, or a, a homeless shelter, or a women's shelter. I saw the Catholic Church there, that they understood that part of our faith and part of evangelizing our faith is this <clears throat> gospel of tenderness and mercy that meets people where they are, you know, that, that part of carrying the saving message of, of Christ out is, is loving others and caring for others and performing works of mercy for others. So Mary models that so, so wonderfully in her life. Okay, how about number six? Mary knew the gift of Jesus wasn't for her alone. Yeah, so we talked about Mary sharing her story, mm. what he's done for me and how wonderful this is. Uh, but Mary recognized that the person of Jesus didn't just come into the world for her to do great things for her. He came to do great things for the whole world. So the nativity mystery that we reflect on during this season of Advent is so emblematic again of this, of this idea that she presents Jesus to the world. I love some of the Renaissance paintings that just kind of show Mary laying Jesus out almost like a feast before us to behold. And isn't it interesting that she takes the cue of the angels who go first to the fringes of the Jewish culture, that is to the shepherds, the ones who were least liked and appreciated, made unclean by their very profession, ritually unclean. And that's where the angels go to, to give the good news first. And those are the first ones that she welcomes into the cave of Bethlehem and says, here is my son, he's for you. So you see a seed form of the church's uh, preferential love for the poor there, that Jesus comes to them first and Mary recognizes that. And then later, as Jesus is an infant, and now Mary and Joseph are in her a home, the Magi come, which represents the nations. And there Mary understands that this Jesus is to be shared not only with my people and with those on the very fringes, but with the whole world. The Magi represent the Gentile nations. So he's intended to be a gift for all. And certainly at the foot of the cross on that lonely brow of Mount Calvary, she must have understood this as an offering of her son you know, for the sins of the world. So again, it's a personal faith that's not privatized. Uh, he's done great things for me, and I share that story, but I recognize that uh, Jesus in me now has to be shared with others. So just as she held Jesus, she also had to birth him, and then after birthing him, manifest him. And that pattern is true for each one of us. We welcome Jesus into our heart. Uh, we cultivate him within us, but then we give birth to him. We incarnate him in our words and our works, and then we reveal him to and others. He, he said that from the cross, mother behold. Yes, behold your son. And it's on that cross where she becomes our mother. And you see that kind of maternal care she not only had for her son there, but she has for the fledgling church that she's with them, praying with them. Uh, and that really leads us into the seventh principle, that is that Mary continues to intercede for the church, that we would be what Pope Francis calls spirit-filled evangelizers, uh, that we would be open to the spirit working in, in our life, giving us the words to speak, to fearlessly carrying the gospel. And Mary was, you know, right there present with them. And in fact, he says the church wouldn't have been an evangelizing community if Mary had not been there because she prayed in a sense, she gave, helped the church give birth again to Christ in the world as this new church emerges. It's really the birthday of the church, Pentecost. She was present for that like a midwife to birth us. And so she calls us, even in that act, to, to be vigilant, to continue to pray that the whole church will become an evangelizing church. We'll all become spirit-filled evangelizers. We'll let the spirit come into our life as it did with Mary, and that we'll um, carry that spirit out into the world that 
Uh, Pope Francis has a great line, to proclaim the gospel with words and a life that is transfigured by the Spirit. That the Spirit within us is continually vivifying us and giving us courage uh, and giving us life and giving us the words to speak to carry this, this good news out. Uh, we, we have to stop. Oh. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, it's what I would like to have happen is I would like you to pray the last, um, the, the last five paragraphs in the, in the joy of the gospel that Pope Francis apparently loves so much and I want to close the show too. So I'm going to close and then I want you to do the prayer. Is that okay? Yes, perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks we for really having really appreciate having you. And thank you for listening. We really appreci appreciate you too. Um, please tune us in again soon. We are on Sunday nights at 6 o'clock and Tuesday mornings at 1030. On behalf of Father John Wooster, I now I'm going to turn over uh, and hear the prayer that is finally the last few pages in The Joy of the Gospel. Yes, and this is Pope Francis asking Mary to intercede for us, and it sums up all the themes that we've looked at today quickly. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Mary, Virgin and Mother, you who moved by the Holy Spirit, welcome the word of life in the depths of your humble faith as you gave yourself completely to the Eternal One, help us to say our own yes to the urgent call as pressing as ever to proclaim the good news of Jesus. Filled with Christ's presence, you brought joy to John the Baptist, making him exult in the womb of his mother. And brimming over with joy, you sang of the great things done by God. Standing at the foot of the cross with unyielding faith, you receive the joyful comfort of the resurrection and join the disciples in awaiting the Spirit so that the evangelizing church might be born. Star of the new evangelization, help us to bear radiant witness to communion, to service, to ardent and generous faith, justice, and love for the poor, that the joy of the gospel may reach to the ends of the earth, illuminating even the fringes of our world. Mother of the living gospel, wellspring of happiness for God's little ones. Pray for us. Amen. Alleluia. Amen. Alleluia. 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 <laughs> Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks so much Tom. for having me. Uh, my pleasure and our pleasure. Thank you. You bet. <laughs>